I do not believe that providing arms would assist democracy in Ukraine, because I do not believe that this is a war for democracy. This is a war over the balance of power in Europe, a war brought about by the desire for security on the part of Russia and the fear of losing power on the part of NATO. The more munitions we provide, the longer the war goes on, and the more devastated Ukraine becomes, more people will die, and with it will die the hope of democracy. That is a lesson we should have learned from our participation in foreign wars. Those are the words of a famous American conservative speaker, which he delivered at a GOP event recently. In fact, I can almost declare with certainty that everyone watching this video has heard of him. He is a very vocal member of the nationalist movement inside the Republican Party, which Donald Trump embraced with his America First policy. He has been very adamant about not sending arms to Ukraine, and has made repeated calls for Ukraine to negotiate terms, to accept that they cannot win against Russia's military might, and they should ultimately surrender portions of their country to protect the peace of Europe and by extension the world. He is of the view that assisting Ukraine is of no benefit to the United States, and that any assertions to the contrary are the machinations of, quote, international finance and the military-industrial complex, manipulated by the Democratic Party to enrich themselves while spreading socialism and communism in America. This conservative speaker is Charles Lindbergh, in a speech he gave on October 15th, 1939. Now I know some of you may think that was a little dishonest of me, but I needed to do that to make my point. All I did was replace Germany with Russia, Europe with Ukraine, and the Allies with NATO. And all of a sudden, that speech sounded like it could have been delivered a week ago instead of over 80 years ago. Isolationism, defeatism, and appeasement are not new ideas. They are old ideas. Ideas which have proven to lead to both death and disaster every time we've tried them. Yet now, with the war in Ukraine, they have resurfaced with a vengeance, with people all over the Western world, though especially in the United States and Germany, falling into the same trap they fell in before. So today, we are going to talk about isolationism, the major players, the flaws in their arguments, and the history of America first, both present and past. Also, I'm going to say this now. There's a couple of disclaimers I have to give. First, this is a video essay and a sort of talking spiel, if you like. It's not going to be one of my full videos with lots of footage, etc, etc. There are two major reasons for this. First, Ukraine videos are getting cracked down on severely by YouTube, so if I include anything spicy like combat footage or even political footage of Zelensky or anything like that, there's a very good chance that this video could get struck and age-restricted, okay? Number one. Number two, this is really long and it is a very heavy subject, and so it's best experienced as a audiobook format or a listening format. There will still be, uh, you know, sort of visual cues on screen, but this is mainly a listening video. So the production value is not going to be as high. The other disclaimers I have to give is that this is your official giant capital letters. I don't know how else I can frame it. This is your massive bias warning. In this video, I am arguing for an aid and interventionist stance in Ukraine, which, like it or not, is a political issue, meaning that this video is an opinion piece. It's not my usual military analysis and geopolitical analysis like I normally do. This is a historical discussion, a historical argument even, mixed with a political argument for contemporary times, and thus it will have a very aggressive political bias against isolationist groups, namely the far right and the authoritarian left. So I am going after both Make America Great Again and America First, and the tankies and vatniks that you see online. So, there is a lot of bias here, there's a lot of my own personal opinions here, you have been warned. So either leave now, or for the more fun of you, grab some popcorn. However, thankfully, because we're discussing such a heavily partisan topic, we have a sponsor to help with journalistic bias. Today we have a returning sponsor to the channel who provide a service I find vital in my day to day. These days, trust in media is at rock bottom, polarization is at its worst, politicization and corporatization of the news has commodified and trivialized the flow of crucial information, but thankfully for us, there is an answer to the problem. Ground news. 
They are one of, if not the best source of news on the internet, and best of all, they cover that news from every angle. You can compare headlines on literally any subject, filter the presented articles by factuality, location, and political bias, all while following specific topics, which for me is very useful for following the war in Ukraine. But today, we are looking at America first and make America great again, so I checked in on Donald Trump, who is currently under siege in the law courts while hitting the campaign trail with Matt Gates, who recently asked the Speaker of the House. And sure enough, you can see how the media is reacting to the newly polarized landscape. And as you can see on the interface to the right here, it shows you the publication, which way it leans and what country it originates from which is a big help when you're trying to filter out the propaganda. Just read the difference in headlines. Us YouTubers can't be up to date 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, even though we try, and the only reason I manage is ground news. So this product is a must to keep up with things going on. But my absolute favorite feature is Blindspot. In here, you can find news stories that are being underreported, which in the polarized political landscape of today is a useful tool to see what different media outlets want you to know and what they don't want you to know. Plus, it can also be a source of fantastic entertainment, seeing some of the more extreme publications and what they are saying. Seriously, it's hilarious, it's easy to use, and the most enjoyable way to read the news. Helping you become a more informed and well-rounded person, able to understand both sides by cutting through the polarization and bias that is so prevalent in the modern world. So, click the link in the description to get a special promotional offer at ground news forward slash anamarchy, and try out this absolutely amazing product. I use it, my colleagues use it, and I highly recommend it. Many thanks to them for sponsoring us today, and now it is time to get back to the video. The United States of America is the most militarily powerful nation in human history, maintaining a defense budget that dwarfs entire national economies while projecting power across the whole globe. It achieves that projection primarily through both naval aviation and the United States Air Force, combined with Allied nation support, as well as over a thousand overseas military installations. The United States maintains a global reaction force alongside active marine expeditionary units and at least five aircraft carrier battle groups at any one time. With these assets, they can deploy enough combat power to defeat 99% of the world's militaries inside of 24 hours, and they can deploy it literally anywhere on the planet. The geopolitical and economic implications of this capability cannot be understated, and for most of the people watching, US military supremacy has been set in stone to the point that it's been a fact of nature for our entire lives. Yet that was not always the case. It wasn't until the Reagan revolution in the turbulent last days of the Cold War that the mighty behemoth we know today came to be. In over half the conflicts it's been involved in, the United States has been caught unprepared for war, and in most of these cases, from 1812 to World War I to Pearl Harbor and even to an extent 9-11, it has always been preceded by a period of complacency, isolationism, and neutrality. And while this video may be targeted at a primarily American audience, it goes out to every Western nation and their relevant far-right parties. Looking at you, alternative for Deutschland. But before anyone cries partisan bias, if you think the Democrats dragging their heels or the far left and their both sides are bad, I'm claiming neutrality bullshit are getting a pass, you are sorely mistaken. As I mentioned before, I'm coming after everybody. Today, I choose violence. I'm fighting everyone because I have a history education. I've read about this and I've seen it all before. I know where it leads and I'll be damned if I'm going to let it happen, at least within my power anyway. Which is not very much, but I'm going to do what I can. Besides, as a YouTuber, I pay US taxes, making this, well, my money. I'm an American taxpayer. But as I'm a foreigner, I don't even get to vote on these issues. So forgive me if I start to vent a bit or get out of control, okay? Please forgive me. So where do we start? Well, let's do what all the big YouTubers say and jump right into it. Feet first, all throttle, no brakes, and with a distinct lack of what the Zoomers define as cap. We are starting both literally and figuratively with the modern incarnation of America first, led by one president, Donald J. Trump. To call this man reprehensible and borderline treasonous would be putting it lightly. If I were to cover all the frankly horrific corruption as well as his crimes against both his own people and the people of the world, and his crimes against the English language, this video would be five hours long before we got to the next topic on the list. So let's narrow it down to issues directly relating to the war in Ukraine, which unsurprisingly and tragically is still a very long subject. 
The most obvious place to start here, of course, is Trump's very good relationship with the perpetrator of this ongoing crime against humanity, Vladimir Putin, and the Russian Federation at large. Now, leaving aside Trump's long list of business interests in Russia and his known collusion with Russian state officials on various corporate enterprises, his campaign's involvement with Russian psyops during his presidential run is the first major scandal everyone takes notice of, and while both sides of the aisle rant and rave about election interference during the 2016 election and what did or did not happen, what is beyond dispute is that after Trump's confirmation as President of the United States, Putin was one of the first world leaders to congratulate him, and Putin himself received a standing ovation in the State Duma to commemorate the occasion. Well, haha, <laughs> I think that speaks for itself. Now I don't want to weigh in on that topic too much. But as a creator who covers this war, I have first-hand experience with the Kremlin Cyber Warfare Division. I have seen so many pro-Russian copypasta comments from both bot accounts and freshly made profiles across not just my channel, but all over Twitter as well, and on the uh, profiles and channels of my colleagues like Dylan Burns TV, Perrin, Laserpig, who in turn have shared notes with other major creators on this very issue. There is plenty of historical precedent here too. KGB had a long history of infiltrating the press throughout Western nations, and in the age of social media, both the FSB and China's MSS have extensive PSYOP departments waging war online. In liberal democracies, the free press and social media is a weapon they'd be absolute morons not to use. And so while I'll openly say and readily admit that the Democrats really lost the 2016 election by running the absolute worst candidate possible and perhaps the only person in the entire country who could probably match Trump's level of corruption, Russian interference in support of his campaign is almost a certainty. And let's be honest, our agencies do it to other countries all the time. Australia's intelligence service got in serious trouble for bugging the phones of Indonesian senior government officials, including the president. And, uh, <laughs> just Google CIA operations in Italy or Operation Condor if you want to get really spicy. But, back on topic. Why would Russia help a man who postures himself as very pro-military and a national strongman? In any other circumstance, such a president would be a devastating blow to the Kremlin. Uh, <laughs> remember last time? Ronald Reagan! Mr. Gorbachev. Tear down this wall. But in this case, it was an absolute gold mine. The isolationist position of the Trump administration did catastrophic damage to the international relationships established by previous US governments. But perhaps most frighteningly of all, Throughout his presidency, he repeatedly floated the idea of a US withdrawal not just from climate agreements, military cooperation agreements, or trade agreements, but a complete withdrawal from NATO as well. Now, many would just pass this off as typical Trumpian bluster. After all, he pathologically lies and claims he can solve geopolitical crises spanning over a century in a single afternoon. I mean, just recently, he mentioned that he could solve the uh, Israel-Hamas crisis currently ongoing at time of recording. He, he, he just came out and said, I can fix it. Yeah, uh, we've been trying to fix that for over half a century now. And uh, just no. But the fact is, regarding his withdrawal request from NATO, people were so concerned about it, Congress actually went full bipartisan. Congress went bipartisan under Trump for one of the first and only times during his presidency by signing legislation which mandates that such a move would require practically every elected official to approve it. However, it didn't stop him from taking other action that directly aided Russia politically and militarily. In a move that caused extreme backlash from service members and veterans as well as the public, Trump ordered the immediate withdrawal of US forces from Syria with no contingency plan and no operational handoff. This essentially resulted in abandoning the Kurdish people to Assad's regime, backed by Russia, and to Turkey, who have been actively conducting genocide against minority groups in their country for over a century. The Kurds and Armenians chief among them. Indeed, within 48 hours of their withdrawal, Russian forces occupied the main US operations base in Syria, Kobani Air Base, while Turkish forces moved in and began a brutal occupation of the region, which includes some reports indicating the use of chemical weapons during the invasion phase. The city of Afrin in particular saw acts of ethnic cleansing carried out by Turkish-backed militias and unrestricted airstrikes against critical infrastructure. The outrage which followed forced the administration to backtrack and redeploy US troops to eastern Syria on a mission to, quote, 
take their oil. But by that time, the damage was done. They had sold out an ally and given Russia the upper hand, all while causing one of the United States' finest military leaders, General James Chaos Actual Mattis, to resign in protest from his post as Secretary of Defense. Look, I don't know about you, I'm not an American, but if the sight of Russian troops raising their flag over an American base doesn't enrage you, I don't know what will. However, the most egregious of his transgressions was, of course, the scandal which brought Ukraine to the front of American domestic politics in 2019, when it was revealed that Trump, abusing his office as President of the United States, bypassed Congress and the DoD by ordering the immediate halt of all financial and military aid to Ukraine after Zelensky's government refused to launch an investigation into the Bidens. This was after Biden's announcement that he would run for president and his subsequent success in the Democratic primaries, which, by the way, that is where an investigation should actually be launched, given how sketchy some of those votes were. I mean, check out Iowa. Shadow Corporation? Literally, Shadow Corp running voting machines? Are you serious? What kind of decision is that? But of course, the DNC will never ever launch that investigation and they'll never let anyone investigate at all. Now, back on topic. Anyway, needless to say, Trump's actions are absolutely insane. Using your nation's highest office to strong arm a foreign government into investigating an American citizen due to him being a political rival? Regardless of whether or not there's just cause, you know, I mean, just as I was just saying before, you don't have to mention to me that corporate Democrats are corrupt. Just look at the storm over Democratic Senator Menendez. Like, the guy's sitting on, like, a huge pile of gold that he mysteriously got from somewhere. Come on. It's not a secret. But the idea, the idea that a sitting president would end run around Congress and directly compromise the foreign interests and national security of the United States for domestic political points? Seriously, not even Nixon went that far. Thankfully, Trump and Rudy Giuliani were caught and they were forced to reinstate the aid to Ukraine. But had that not been the case, had they not been caught, there was, and in the terrifying event of his re-election, there still is a real possibility that Russian forces would make gains and Ukrainian lives would be lost as a direct result of his corrupt practices and isolationist policy. And I know this will be obvious to most of my audience, but for those of you who don't see it, a Ukrainian defeat is in Russia's interests. And if something is in Russia's interest, there is a very, very high possibility that it's against American and, by extension, Western interests, namely our interests. But enough about Trump. Enough about him. I'm sick of talking about him. I'm sick of hearing about him. I just want him to go away. I want him to get locked up. And if I went into a full deep dive on him, we'd be here for years and all I'd get is a comment section with a collective IQ of four telling me I'm a Jewish communist lizard clone running a trafficking organization out of New England and to go back to real England. Though I'm a half-Jewish anarchist from a colony, so I guess they aren't completely wrong. Point is, he is the figurehead of the modern American isolationist movement and his MAGA movement are its rank of file. Make America great again. MAGA, just in case you haven't worked that out. But he by no means is alone in this enterprise. As the old saying goes, a man is judged by the company he keeps, and this could not be more apt a statement. The right flank, as they've been called, of the Republican Party form the backbone of the MAGA Make America Great Again movement and their presence in both Congress and the Senate. Perhaps the most infamous being Marjorie Taylor Greene, she has constantly argued for the US military to withdraw from almost all its international alliances and agreements, including NATO and the UN missions in both the Balkans and Korea, for withdrawal from Syria, but most vitriolic of all, and most aggressively of all, she wants to stop support for Ukraine. She has repeatedly made allegations that it was Ukraine who instigated the conflict. In fact, when questioned on the issue of the war, she has, rather ironically, given her nationalist isolationist position, completely towed the Kremlin party line, and has advocated for a peace plan in Russia's favour, namely the surrender of Ukrainian territory and citizens to Russian control. She has also expressed admiration for Putin's government, specifically its anti-LGBT policies and its, quote, refusal to tolerate wokeness, end quote. 
She has described herself as a Christian nationalist, is fanatically anti-abortion while promoting traditional gender roles, and has made derogatory comments regarding almost every minority group in the United States that were so bad it caused even her own party to condemn her on multiple occasions. Charming woman. Moving on from her, and that train wreck, we have presidential hopefuls Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy. Both have made the war in Ukraine a campaign issue, and both, unsurprisingly, advocate for the cessation of all military aid, with Vivek Ramaswamy directly comparing the situation to Afghanistan and, by implication, the Ukrainian government to the Taliban. Why are you against supporting Ukraine? Because it does not advance American interests, and as the US president, I'm not running for any other role other than looking after the interests of Americans. However, my plan to end the Ukraine war will actually be probably better for Ukraine. At least it comes out with sovereignty intact. How so? Which is not the plan they're on right now. You mark my words, the way this war ends right now, without the U.S. actually stepping in and saying we're not going to fund any more of it, is going to be some post-Zelensky warlord takes over with a couple hundred billion dollars of American military equipment, just like what happened after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and you see how far that got. His plan for resolving the conflict is simple. Pressure the Ukrainian government to surrender all territory currently occupied by Russian forces to the Russian Federation. Essentially, his argument is, if we cut aid to Ukraine, we can force them to surrender and accept defeat. Ron DeSantis, meanwhile, has dismissed the war as a territorial dispute that is no concern of the United States, though he was forced to walk back on that after public outcry. Since then, he has focused more on domestic policies in his home state of Florida, like education reform in the public school system, where they are now teaching kids that slavery actually benefited the black community and taught African Americans marketable skills, which provides a perfect segue to one of the most outspoken proponents of America First in certain conservative circles. You see, during Trump's presidential campaign in 2016, the Senate seat of Louisiana was up for grabs. And who ran for that seat? Who ran for that seat under the Make America Great Again platform as a member of the Republican Party? In fact, his election slogan was America First. Who was this great American patriot? Well, he was none other than David Duke, former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Look, I could go on forever listing this menagerie of morons, but for the sake of brevity to get through them, Let's have a quick fire round. Take Matt Gates for our first example. Look at him. Look at him in this hearing. I swear to God, there are two brain cells in there, and they are fighting like hell for third place. Then there's Jackson Hinkle, banned from YouTube, self-proclaimed MAGA communist who was recently filmed in Russia, firing Russian weapons dressed in Russian uniforms, because that's true patriotism. And then there's Rand Paul. I mean... Do I need to go there? He has a long track record. Suffice to say, his proposed revision to the budget removed literally all aid to Ukraine, and he promotes a full withdrawal of US support to the NATO mission in Eastern Europe. Honestly, I think I've made my point. America First is a cancer on American democracy. They are a group which engaged in electoral fraud, leading to a comically bad coup attempt which is actually something they have in common with the Russians on at least several levels, so maybe it's no surprise they're fans. They're a group of people who, during the middle of a rent and cost of living crisis, want to abolish the remaining components of the New Deal, while holding the opinion that American overseas interests would be best served by completely abandoning the foreign policy objectives of the United States since Theodore Roosevelt over a hundred years. And their party leader is a man on trial for 91 felony charges endorsed by the former Grand Wizard of the KKK. And to top it all off, when you align their policies side by side with Putin's Russia, there is almost a complete overlap. Religious nationalism, persecution and erasure of minority groups, anti-LGBT policies, restriction of women's rights, the removal of checks and balances in both the democratic process and in business regulations to promote corporate interests while strengthening the office of the executive and the president, overt attempts to rig elections and intimidate political opponents, all of this leading to withdrawals from international agreements, trade agreements, and defensive alliances to pursue directly imperialist wars. Again, as Trump himself said, we're going to take their oil, end quote. They're imperialists. America first is America's Putinist faction. 
They are the oligarchs. They are the fascists. Trump and his gang aren't allies of Putin. They are Putin. Trump is America's answer to Putin, only far less competent with one-tenth the intellect. There is nothing surprising in their pro-Russian stance. Their interests align with the Kremlin, some of them are almost certainly funded by the Kremlin, and the damage they and their ideology will do, not just to the United States, but to the free world in general, is practically incalculable. However, the tragedy is, as I indicated at the beginning of this video, America First is not a new political movement. Although it has been hijacked by the Trumpian cult for the modern era of American politics, the original movement has much in common with its contemporary iteration. The original America First movement began during the later months of 1939. After extensive pressure from the public, the Roosevelt administration signed into law a series of neutrality acts. These acts stipulated that American arms manufacturers and financial institutions could not engage with belligerent nations except on an ad hoc basis, nicknamed cash and carry. All participants in the conflict could buy and sell arms inside the United States on the understanding that they pay for it up front and transport the arms themselves. This resulted in a bunch of silly things like when the US uh, offered aid to the UK, they couldn't ship the aircraft and the tanks and such out of the country because it would violate the Neutrality Act, so they had to park them off the Canadian border and then the Canadians would have to grab some horses and tow them across through the dirt. Like, crazy stuff like that. It led to a lot of shenanigans, but point is, you had to buy it and ship it yourself. Otherwise, it would violate US law. Now, this whole thing, this whole thing was a concession to the Roosevelt government, as it obviously favoured Britain and France. But even this minor concession was considered too far by the isolationist movement in the US. Extensive lobbying was carried out by various far-right and far-left groups, to embargo all nations currently at war in Europe, claiming that any involvement in the conflict, even economic activity, would risk dragging the United States into the war and cost American lives. The majority of Americans, however, while not wanting to be directly involved, did support aiding Britain and France against Germany, especially after the annexation of Czechoslovakia despite Hitler's assurances. It's almost as though, guys, Dictators lie and disregard treaties. Like, um, I mean, we signed all those agreements in the 1990s and then there was Chechnya and Georgia and... Uh, but no, 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 it's fine. If we agree with dictators now, they'll honor their agreements. Absolutely. They'll, they'll, if, if we sign another... It's like, you know, American transport policy. We'll just, add an, we'll just add another lane. We'll add another lane. We'll sign another treaty. Putin will listen to another treaty, we promise. <clears throat> anyway, look. Back on topic. It wasn't until war properly broke out that America First quickly began to coalesce into an official party. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland and the Neutrality Act was quickly updated to cope with this new reality. American citizens were forbidden from joining the conflict and partisan positions on the war were largely kept out of the political arena. I mean, they did show up occasionally, but they tried to keep out of it. All that being said, the United States arms industry was still permitted to trade with the belligerent powers and trade they did. Under the terms of cash and carry, as mentioned before, the Allies conducted transatlantic trade without issue. This policy was designed directly to aid them while maintaining official neutrality. Like, they want to help Britain and France, but they can't obviously be seen to help Britain and France. But... But... Corporate America is... Well... Corporate America. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the amount of morals and integrity Corporate America has by now. If they can play both sides, they will. And play both sides, they definitely did. Something we will touch on later in this video. But there was one corporation in particular. One corporation that preferred supporting the Nazis. All while refusing requests outright to produce equipment for, and I quote directly, the godforsaken British. End quote. That corporation and its founder, in a twist that surprises absolutely no one, was also America First's biggest sponsor and its most famous member. That man was, of course, Henry Ford. Henry Ford's anti-Semitism is well known. In his ownership of the Dearborn Independent, as well as its subsidiary publications across several languages, he is responsible for the widespread circulation of the infamous Protocols of the Elders of Zion. 
a book which is considered the foundational work of modern anti-Semitism and still directly impacts the world today. Indeed, the conspiracy theories in said book are the ones most often found amongst far-right groups in America, including the KKK, various groups of neo-Nazis, and QAnon, all of which having considerable overlap with the Make America Great Again movement and America First. However, if it was just ideological similarities with Nazi Germany, Henry Ford would simply be one of many. After all, the German-American Bund existed under George Lincoln Rockwell, and then, of course, there was the first director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, let's be real here. When Dr. Stuckert, author of the Nuremberg Laws, was looking for a draft document to design his system for calculating Jewishness, he took a considerable amount of inspiration from the Jim Crow Laws. While some aspects were definitely harsher and more aggressive, for obvious reasons, I mean, you only have to look at what happened later, he didn't copy the Jim Crow Laws completely because he felt that the German public might find some of the interracial policies too extreme. Let that one sink in for a minute. The, the Nazis found some of the Jim Crow laws too extreme. But of course, Henry Ford wasn't just sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Oh no. He was a direct contributor. Ford Motor Company's German branch was a cornerstone of the German war effort, and Henry Ford was a personal idol of Hitler himself. He even got a shout out in Mein Kampf, along with the highest honor Nazi Germany could award a foreigner, the Order of the German Eagle, an award he shared, incidentally, with the man who opened this video, Charles Lindbergh, who got the award for similar reasons. Fun fact about Charles Lindbergh, actually. While he was the primary representative of America first, he also directly contributed to the American diplomatic efforts in Europe as the United States Air Attaché. During the Munich crisis, when they were negotiating over Czechoslovakia, he joined forces with JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, himself an anti-Semite and isolationist, to promote appeasement and even cooperation with Nazi Germany. He actually went to the Allied governments and said, look, you shouldn't be uh, negotiating with Germany, you should be cooperating. He would later state his reason for this to be, quote, building the white race's ramparts against the Asiatic Oriental horde from Russia in order to defeat the scourge of communism the greatest threat to the solidarity and future of the white race. Charles Lindbergh uh, attacked the Jews and used the term white race quite often. So much so, in fact, that uh, President Roosevelt was quoted as saying, if I died tomorrow, I would die certain that Charles Lindbergh is a Nazi, or at least a Nazi sympathizer. And many members of the American public agreed, which is why he was fired as America First representative a bit later. But uh, with his comments and his attitude, as well as the other members of the far-right movement of America First, links to the KKK in the movement aren't a new thing. And in an interesting twist, the leading female representative of the movement was someone rather more refined than Marjorie Taylor Greene is. America First's female representative in 1940 was none other than the first lady of American cinema, Lillian Gish. But I hear you ask... What was her most famous role? Why is it so important that she was America First's female representative? Well, the role that launched her career, the role which defined her and made her a star, was none other than the leading lady from the film Birth of a Nation, the most infamous piece of Lost Cause pro-KKK propaganda in American history. She remained a staunch advocate of America First, a friend to Charles Lindbergh, and a member of the Republican Party until her death in 1993. But, back to the main topic. Ford Motors would continue to produce vehicles for the Wehrmacht throughout the entirety of Germany's rearmament phase, as well as during the war itself. Here we can see Ford trucks during the invasion of the Soviet Union, and this production continued even after the United States joined the war, allegedly and I have to say that a lot in this part, allegedly, with the direct consent of Henry Ford himself. However, the company strenuously denies violating the Trading with the Enemy Act, for obvious reasons, claiming that its subsidiary was stolen by the Nazis and they had no control. Despite that, though, the US government was forced to pay Ford Motors compensation for damages done to company property by Allied bombing raids. So when the 8th Air Force bombed Ford's factory in Germany, uh, the government had to pay Henry for damaging his stuff. 
He also kept the profits from the German war production post-war. Profits partially earned by use of slave labor from the death camps, including Auschwitz. Though in fairness, they weren't the only company to do this. Coca-Cola and General Motors got reimbursed for damages to their installations as well, and they too continued business with Germany via their subsidiaries. Both made use of the same opportunities for slave labor, and they both reclaimed their assets after the war, keeping the profits in the process. Then there was IBM, who allegedly provided early punch card computers for the German government, evading an embargo in the process. Computers which they used in their indexing systems. Indexing what, you may ask? Well, um, ask yourself, what complex numbers on a large scale would the Nazis specifically need to assign, manage, catalogue and keep track of? You know, punch card computers are really good for tracking uh, serial numbers. You can work it out from there. But perhaps the biggest profits made were made by the chemical and energy corporations. DuPont Chemicals and Standard Oil being the two biggest, who both directly collaborated with the German chemical giant IG Farben. Ever wondered how the Nazis were able to produce synthetic fuel, and more importantly, synthetic rubber, which it is no exaggeration to say kept their entire war effort alive? Uh, yeah, that was them. And they too kept their money. In fact, it's an interesting part of history that following right behind the Allied advance during the liberation of Europe, there were specialist teams carrying out specific roles, groups such as the famous Monuments Men, finding stolen art and national relics, as well as other famous war correspondents, artists, engineers, people who were filling in the blanks and covering things that the military couldn't cover. But among those teams, among those teams were civilian contractors who were in fact corporate liquidator squads, seizing back various business assets along with all the money associated with them, even if that money was earned via the Holocaust. And if you want to know how deep this goes, after World War II ended, a process of what was called denazification began, a word you've heard in recent times used in a completely different and incorrect context. But yes, in Germany, denazification began. And a lot of the businesses that had collaborated with the Nazis during their rise to power and during the war had been consolidated into large corporate concerns. Companies like IG Farben, the Hermann Göring Werke, Thyssen Krupp, Rheinmetall, they had all been consolidated into big corporations that ran the war effort. So, when denazification happened, those big corporations were broken down into their little individual companies. But, once those companies were broken apart and back in their decentralized state, those companies were allowed to continue working. They carried on. They didn't get any, any trouble, they didn't get punished, they just continued working. And one such firm was a firm called Degusa, currently known as Evonik Corporation. They in turn owned a company by the name of Degesh Chemicals. This company was a prominent part of the corporation IG Farben, and one of its most profitable subsidiaries. Their speciality was the production and distribution of industrial pesticides, their flagship product being Zyklon B. The profits they gained for supplying their product to the SS, they kept. They kept their money. The company which made the gas that they used to carry out the Holocaust they kept the money. Their chairman was indicted for his role in the Holocaust, and he was acquitted. And they continue operating. This company continues operating to this very day. In fact, if you live in a rural area or work on a farm, you yourself, dear viewer, may be a customer, as one of their largest markets is serviced by none other than Degesh America. That's right, in the 1970s, they expanded to the US, and here is their website. They even had the same logo until recently. I guess the PR department finally caught on that having the same logo found on Zyklon B canisters wasn't good for business. <sighs> Gotta love it. Capitalism is great. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing for us here in 2023 that our war is a bit more transparent. While I won't claim they are acting altruistically, most corporations have pulled out of Russia due to sanctions and public pressure. It's thanks to, of course, globalization. 
because these are global brands now, the backlash they would get for supporting Russia would cost them more money in brand damage than they would gain continuing sales to Russian markets. Some industries, like the energy sector, have continued to do business with Russia, given that they hold a monopoly on oil and gas in Eastern Europe, but efforts are underway to move over to renewables, while United States oil production has started to take up the slack. The ruble is suffering, having dropped back down to the same valuation it had the day after the invasion began in February 2022, and the Russian economy is steadily becoming more and more isolated. And even after all this and Russia's horrendous battlefield performance, Make America Great Again and America First loudly proclaim from the rooftops that victory is impossible. Peace at any price is a price worth paying. That all foreign aid should be cut and focused on Americans, even though in every single vote they have held on domestic spending, they have voted to cut the programs that support the poorest Americans, including the VA and veterans benefits. So much for loving America while you throw the men and women who gave their very body and soul for it on the trash heap. Fortunately, though, Make America Great Again and America First in this day and age don't have a Henry Ford. Could you imagine if they did? Imagine the outcry if we had one of America's richest and most powerful businessmen intentionally spreading Russian propaganda. Imagine if we had a market leader continue trading in Russia despite the sanctions. Imagine if he bought out a large media outlet specifically to push far-right racist ideology, even supporting Germany's neo-Nazi political party that practices Holocaust denial while silencing voices in support of Ukraine. And God forbid he used his overseas subsidiaries to directly aid the enemy while refusing access to or aid to our allies, causing the deaths of civilians, all while claiming that he is maintaining neutrality and arguing for peace. Imagine, just imagine, if we had someone like that. <clears throat> nah, crap, sorry. Sorry, my editing software was glitching out. Thankfully, I have this test card of completely unrelated artwork I can put up in the meantime. <coughs> Sorry, I had to pull this artwork. It's actually a print. I got it out of a dusty filing cabinet. I had to scan it in. So it has a bit of a musky smell, if you will. But uh, my friend Scylla did amazing work on it. It is interesting, though. When looking at the list of corporations that pulled out of Russia, Twitter was actually one of them. Yet for some reason, that decision was overturned. Um, I don't know why that was. Uh, we'll have to... I'll have to, uh, there's, there's probably a bunch of legal stuff going on, and it's allegedly, allegedly, but anyway, what was I, what was I talking about? All right, isolationism. Okay, cool. But, you know, I've only been tackling one side of the aisle so far, and that's not fair. And so, in the interests of balance, I think it's about time I start swinging the other way. It's time to call on Her Holiness Saint Javelin, because it's time to wipe out some tankies. As America First was forming in the United States, it wasn't just a hangout for the racists, anti-Semites, and cowards. Not just a hangout for those. But it was a big tent movement of all those opposed to involvement in World War II. In the beginnings, there were genuinely concerned people who'd suffered losses during World War I and wanted to avoid a repeat of the same mistake. More numerous still were pacifists and conscientious objectors. Now, I can see why people take this path for religious reasons, and occasionally moral reasons. However, more often than not, it seems to be a refuge for the sanctimonious and self-righteous to virtue signal at other people, proclaiming superior morality. Uh, I mean, just ever since the invention of the internet, you've seen pacifists and uh, conscientious objectives doing exactly that. They're always sitting on the fence proclaiming, oh, I am so much better than you because I hold these opinions. Uh, something that has gotten worse in more recent times over a topic I'm not going to touch on in this video. And as for conscientious objectors, Desmond Doss, the famous Medal of Honor winner for rescuing numbers of critically wounded personnel during the Battle of Okinawa, people like him should stand as a monument for all time that just because you vow not to take life or engage in combat doesn't mean you have the right to sit things out. In the face of monstrosities like fascism and imperialism, neutrality isn't a beacon of enlightened reason. It is your consent to the evils taking place in the knowledge that it doesn't hurt you or worse, tacitly benefits you. Then, as now, we who are far away from the front lines have the luxury to hold these positions, and some will continue to hold them until the day our inaction comes to bite us in the ass. And even then, people will still hold out and try to cling on to that superior sense of morality. 
When U-boats started sinking American ships off the coast of Canada, Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh claimed it was most likely a false flag attack launched by, quote, international financiers in league with the British to draw America into the war. It took the events of a sleepy Sunday morning on December 7th, 1941 to change things. For us today, as Russian bombers test our airspace, while China commissions full-size aircraft carriers every other year, one has to ask, when will our moment be? When will we find out, as they say? But for some, it wasn't even association with the enemy's ideology. Nor was it a moralistic position. No. It was a position they took because they were ordered to by their superiors who hold that position, or they simply didn't care if millions died, as long as they had the final say in the outcome at the end. Enter the Marxist-Leninists, aka the Tankies. After Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union concluded their alliance to divide Eastern Europe while providing economic aid to one another, the communist parties of the West, despite having been ferociously opposed to the fascist movements in their countries, immediately defected to the isolationist stance. When the German-American Bund held its famous rally in New York on February 20th, 1939, the communists formed the most aggressive unit of counter-protesters. They were throwing stuff, starting fights. Yet less than six months later, these crusaders of freedom in the working class, upon hearing that Stalin had signed an alliance with Hitler, started flocking to America first or preaching isolationism on the basis of, quote, anti-imperialism. Declaring neutrality on the Nazis in the name of anti-imperialism. Meanwhile, in France, a nation under occupation by the Nazis directly, communist marquee units formed during the instability of the interwar years stood down and refused to take action alongside the other units of the French resistance as a matter of principle. It wasn't until the German invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, that these movements changed their tune. But by then, a considerable amount of damage and a number of people had been killed. I have a whole video planned on the complicity of Stalin's regime in starting World War II, as well as their economic support of Nazi Germany. It will ruffle some feathers, I'm sure. Fast forward back to the present, in the far left today, we see a similar division. Anarchists and libertarian socialists like myself, though not always, tend to support Ukraine as an anti-imperialist measure or as a matter of community defense. A community of people is being invaded by a foreign power, and so they are banding together to defend themselves. That is a pretty standard libertarian leftist position. While many of us may not approve of the Western military industrial complex and European imperialism, such as France's actions in West Africa, or the various interventions made by the US in other conflicts, we view the invasion of Ukraine by Putin as an outright imperialist war by a fascist oligarchy bent on settler colonialism. We've seen Russians start moving into Mariupol and other occupied territories to Russify eastern Ukraine, as well as carrying out atrocities against the civilian populace. Just as our ideological predecessors did during World War II, we realize that in this case, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Fascists must be stopped at all costs. And liberal capitalist democracy, for all of its faults, we have many complaints, is a hell of a lot better than a Russian oligarchic fascist empire. I'd prefer the outcome of a war to be a McDonald's occupation rather than a military one built on mass graves. I'm also, personally, not opposed to the military-industrial complex per se. I just want it to be heavily unionized and worker-owned while tripling down on the Second Amendment. Worker-owned M1 Abrams and union-owned battleships on the picket line is a future to strive for. But I digress, that's my own opinion. For the other side, we have the Marxist-Leninists. The Trotskyists, aka Marxist-Leninists, who are mad they didn't get to do any gulagging or genociding. Or, uh, as my friend Intergalactic Bin Man labelled them the other day, Trotskyists are just hipster tankies. And the other branches of what many refer to as the authoritarian left. These individuals refer to people like me as anarcho-natoists. Though rather they are simply mouthpieces for the Kremlin and basically red conservatives. They haven't gotten over the fact that it's not the 50s anymore. The Soviet Union is dead and China abandoned socialism for a hybrid economy. And so they valiantly defend the genocidal imperialist actions of long dead tyrants to justify their god-awful geopolitical positions. 
It's interesting that a group of so-called committed anti-imperialists have adopted the Kremlin party line that Ukraine isn't a real country and their culture doesn't exist to contort themselves around the fact that Russia is conducting a war of cultural genocide and settler colonialism. Even though Lenin himself, despite contradicting it in his actions later, wrote a long treatise about the distinct culture and nationhood of Ukraine, one which Putin cites as the mistake of the Bolsheviks to grant them independence, which is what he used to justify this war in the first place. Which is a rich claim, given that Kiev was a mighty city at the heart of a trade empire, while Moscow was still a swamp. However, some of these people do have some self-awareness, which is why they declare neutrality publicly, but repeatedly post and circulate pro-Russian sources. Kind of what you see with, again, the aforementioned incidents that's happened recently that I'm not going to talk about. it. But there are people who do not claim neutrality. There are people who openly double down in support of Russia. There are big creators who are out there on the left proclaiming their support for Russia's actions as an anti-imperialist measure. Hassan Piker. Not just my perspective on the matter. I'm just a, you know, dumb idiot uh, with a Twitch stream who who is live reacting to the news and trying to make sense of everything as it's ongoing. I usually have a policy of not covering breaking news, and and uh, sometimes that policy is violated. But uh, ultimately, I am not uh, held up by the same journalistic standards, even though I think I do a much better job than most other news outlets in uh, in general. So. He is one of the most openly anti-Ukraine, quote, leftists in the mainstream space. He's one of the biggest. And even before this conflict, he was one creator on the left I truly, truly despised. He has been an avalanche of terrible takes from day one, and in almost every case defers to the Kremlin's political line on any given issue. He is also just a loudmouthed, obnoxious, can't say that word on youtube he pushes disinformation he claims that all the referendums held by russia are legitimate he makes the argument of ethnic russians in crimea etc 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 frames just about every situation to do with the war incorrectly and quite frankly i just don't like him i really really don't like hassan he is a loud-mouthed knob if there is one political creator i would remove from the internet it would be him at least Ben Shapiro is funny to watch implode. Behold, leftist infighting strikes again without fail. But let's be honest, it's been, what, almost an hour? And all it's been is me teaching you the history of the isolationist movement and throwing an awful lot of shade. And to be honest, it's been rather entertaining and therapeutic for me to do it. The problem is, it doesn't do anything to counter their arguments, which is what a lot of people will be saying in the comments. So... Let's close out the video with my rebuttals to their major points, which thankfully won't take too long besides the first point, as the rest require maybe less than a paragraph, if that. So let's get on to their first point. It's their only major point, and it's the argument about what almost every argument in politics is about. In fact, just about every argument in life is about. Their first argument is about money. The common argument you hear from almost every far-right party in the Allied Nations is that spending on Ukraine is far too high, and those funds should be redirected to domestic spending, or another country currently undergoing difficulties, which we are not covering today. They paint the war as a money pit, a forever war, a hopeless or otherwise lost cause, and a burden which they feel the taxpayer should not be bearing. Now, some people interpret this as their strongest point, but in reality, it's their weakest by far. So let's look at the numbers. We will be working in near estimates because precise data is hard to come by and my math isn't exactly top tier. There's a reason I'm a historian and not a pilot like I wanted to be. The United States budget for the fiscal year of 2024 is, Congress shenanigans notwithstanding, sitting around $6.5 trillion. The Democrats want it to be closer to $7 trillion, but good luck getting that past the GOP. So 6.5 is a good ballpark figure. Of that 6.5 trillion, 1.9 of it is listed for discretionary spending. That's money the US government can spend on things it needs should something come up, like say, I don't know, a war with our biggest European rival armed with the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons on Earth, for example. 
Keep in mind that around 6% of the mandatory spending budget is already allocated towards defence as is, because defence is understandably a mandatory cost, which means the discretionary fund can augment that, which is currently budgeted at just under half of the discretionary budget for defence, so call it 750 billion of the 1.9 trillion is already allocated to supplement the Pentagon. And all of this doesn't include the shadow budget, which by its nature is secret. There are entire economies worth of unmarked spending on things they don't want people finding out about, namely covert operations, the CIA, and weapons development. Alright, so let's get to the point, shall we? The US budget is $6.5 trillion. Discretionary spending is $1.9 trillion, half of which being allocated to the defense budget. $830 billion, with another $750 billion in reserve should they need it. So that's, you know, roughly, how much is that? Maybe $1.5 trillion is allocated to defense should they need it. So, with that in mind, what is the total value of American aid to Ukraine since January of 2022? The answer, $85 billion. 85 billion. Billion. With a B. 85 billion. Or in other words, 1.5% of the total budget, 4% of the discretionary spending budget, and around 10% of the dedicated defense budget, not including the discretionary spending amount, which drops it to around 6%. Now, I'm not going to say that $85 billion is a small amount of money. If anything, you know, anything with a B in front of it is officially classified as, quote, real money. But when you put it up against what the United States spends on, well, to be honest, literally everything else, it really isn't a game-changing figure. I mean, total aid to Ukraine is probably equivalent to the NYPD's budget. What is game-changing, though, is the effect that that money has had. For the low cost of less than 2% of the budget... The United States, we, because again, may I remind you, I'm saying we because I too am a US taxpayer, we have destroyed or captured, according to the confirmed data, and this is not the claims put out by Ukraine, this is from Oryx and other OSINT sources, confirmed data, for that $85 billion, we have destroyed over 2,000 main battle tanks, 1,000 armored fighting vehicles, 3,000 military trucks, 350 APCs, 300 infantry mobility vehicles such as MRAPs or Humvees, 250 command vehicles full of electronic warfare and communications equipment, 350 engineering vehicles, 40 anti-tank missile vehicles, 100 artillery support vehicles, 500 self-propelled artillery pieces, 300 towed artillery pieces, 280 multiple launch rocket systems, 200 anti-air systems, 50 high-powered radars, 50 electronic warfare installations, over a hundred helicopters, over a hundred combat aircraft, and a rough total of a hundred thousand Russian soldiers killed in action. Give or take a couple thousand. Now I don't have the exact figures for how much all of that costs, and it definitely wasn't just US aid alone that achieved all that. That comes from the aid of all of the countries that have come together to help in the effort to fight against Russian fascism. And of course, I think the Ukrainians deserve some of the credit, you know, considering, you know, it's their country. But I will say, but I will definitely say, that our return on investment was definitely a net profit. And, speaking of profit, let's get to the darker part of this discussion. Because, ironically enough, the nasty side of America's involvement in World War II that I railed against earlier in this script, both then and now, also proves to be one of our greatest assets. On this channel and around the world, we support the Ukrainian cause because we feel that it is the morally righteous thing to do. And that support for Ukraine has been remarkable. It cannot be understated that the grassroots support for the fight against imperialist tyranny has been a key factor in Ukraine's success. My good friend Anna, a native of Kharkiv, has been raising money since day one, living through the loss of both family and friends as constant air raids keep her up at night. Yet she has organized everything from cars to drones to medical supplies. It's truly inspiring stuff to see. But the fact of the matter is, like it or not, we live in a global late-stage capitalist economy. And in this world, whether it be the governments or the businesses, no one does anything for free. The reality is, if the United States or the other allied powers didn't get anything out of this war, or if their national security didn't depend on this war, we would leave the Ukrainians to die. 
Sure, we'd host the odd GoFundMe. Myself and the NAFO boys would keep doing our part. The UN would contribute more hot air to climate change than ExxonMobil, telling everyone how bad they are and how angry they are at the Russians and how this should all stop and we should call for peace. But the reality is, Russia would grind Ukraine down with the bodies of their own men until the Ukrainians run out of ammo. And even then, from what I've seen of Ukrainian resistance, there'd be a few weeks with just bayonets before it came to that. Foreign military aid is vital to the war effort. Without it, they will be very limited on resupply, and any form of victory will be flat out impossible. But not to worry, ladies, gentlemen, and variations thereupon. For if I may borrow the words of, ironically enough, of all people, the Russian badger. Because we've got something they'll never have. Ah! Discretionary spending. It's a bird, it's a plane, oh no, it's Lockheed Martin. That's right. The military-industrial complex. Now, apart from the fact that Russia winning a war on the geopolitical and strategic level will harm our interests by allowing them to compete with us both militarily and economically, nothing motivates the Western world more than the possibility of making some big, fat stacks. And the amount of money we stand to gain, and I'm going to be honest here, it's ludicrous completely and utterly ludicrous so when i hear them make arguments about how much the war costs and how it will bankrupt our nations while pointing to the rising cost of living homelessness and the healthcare crisis i need to demonstrate how moronic their arguments actually are and why even without the clear moral impetus for doing so and the sheer minuscule amount of aid to ukraine takes out of our budget i'm going to point out why supporting ukraine is in our best interests materially all right, so let's get the big one out the way. The good old-fashioned military-industrial complex. God, it's a beautiful thing. Even with all the horrible things that come with it, you can't help but admire the sheer technological and economic prowess it creates and wields. It's incredible. I mean, the B-2 stealth bomber, the F-22, the M-1 Abrams, the Abrams X, the T-14 Armata. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and since the war in Ukraine began, the Western military-industrial complex has seen not just high growth, but exponential growth. Every single major Western arms manufacturer has seen a huge jump in both productivity and share price, with the US Big Five, that being Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, and Boeing, seeing exceptionally high profits. And when I say high... The United States arms manufacturing sector has seen a 50% increase in exports to foreign governments. 50%. To put that in perspective, in the post-Cold War world, that is unheard of. That's insane. And because it's to foreign governments, that makes it pure profit. No incestuous tax dollars here. That is money in the bank. And they are just getting started. Every single NATO member has committed to expanding their defense spending, while the two new members, Sweden and Finland, are brand new markets readily available to be exploited, albeit to a reduced degree given Sweden's strong domestic arms industry. But Finland is a more promising prospect. They have committed to F-35, which will free up their old F-18s alongside Australia's and Canada's old F-18s. Whether they could find a home in Ukraine is up for debate and a question of feasibility, reliability, spare parts, operational integrity, etc. But that does provide an option for the Ukrainians for another aircraft should they need it, and one that we could get them relatively quickly. Plus, I love the F-18, and I would love for Australian F-18s to defend Ukrainian skies. Please, please, I have a whole video planned on that very concept, but... I just want to see it. I want us to do more down here in Australia. But that does bring up another segue, another aspect of this discussion. When we talk about the actual dollar value of the aid we've provided to Ukraine, the argument is often framed as, we gave this bag of money to Ukraine and now it's gone. Or if they have more than one IQ point, maybe two or three, we gave Ukraine all this shiny new equipment fresh off the factory floor, which we paid bajillions for, and we're getting ripped off. The reality is, with the exception of a few big ticket items like Patriot and HIMARS, which fill a very specific capability requirement for the Ukrainian armed forces, 
the majority of what we've sent has been older gear or the reserve stocks of stuff we weren't using. In fact, a lot of the stuff we've sent to Ukraine has saved us money because it was just sitting in depots and warehouses which we've had to pay people to store and maintain. We've already bought this gear. It's a sunk cost. And for a decent amount of it, we were going to replace it anyway. Just look at the old Cold War era Martyrs and Leopard 1s, the M113s and the Humvees, all those surplus Max Pros we had from the war in Afghanistan, first generation Bradleys. All these vehicles were out of date, obsolete. They were going to be headed for eternal mothball or worse, the scrap heap. But now they are on the field of battle doing what they were always designed to do, what they were born to do, kill Russians. And they are doing it very, very well. They are still relevant, still useful, and most of all, they are better than the Ukrainians' old Soviet gear by a considerable margin. The thing is though, while this is excellent and what we should be doing, Europe doesn't have the large reserve of equipment that the United States or Russia does, yet they have donated a considerable amount of their stockpiles to Ukraine already. Poland, the Baltics, Luxembourg, like seriously, Estonia, Latvia, those countries, they've dumped half their reserves into Ukraine. Luxembourg practically donated their entire stock of defense articles, everything they had. The UK, meanwhile, has been providing cruise missiles, advanced weapon systems, and laws. They have been carrying hard, and the Ukrainians really appreciate it. But here's the thing. All of our allies are going to need to replace all the stock they've given away, as well as build up their reserve stocks with NATO standard equipment. They'll need that equipment and new weapons that will integrate seamlessly across the Alliance while providing a more effective kill chain. And after the war is over, Ukraine is going to need to redesign its entire military from scratch to meet NATO operating requirements. And talk about Finland and frickin' Sweden, they're going to need to fill in their backstocks of old Soviet gear and foreign gear they've imported with NATO standard stuff, and all this is going to happen. Now I wonder, dear viewer, ask yourself, hypothetically, who could possibly, who could possibly be in a position to provide our friends with these weapons? Who possibly has the industrial base, financial motivation, and market-leading technology to accommodate this demand in the market? I wonder, who could that be? During World War II, the United States neared 100% employment and had what is, without question, the most incredible period of economic growth and productivity in human history. This was an economy that rose out of the Great Depression into an economy that could build several thousand ships and a hundred thousand aircraft a year without breaking a sweat. This was an economy that could wage two intercontinental wars, wiping out entire fascist empires while losing the least amount of people among all major combatants. Now I'm not saying that the war in Ukraine will provide this same level of rejuvenation. It won't, not even close but it is definitely having an effect. I couldn't find exact figures for this, but thankfully, I have some anecdotal data because of what I do. For you see, I am old friends with someone who works for General Dynamics. Hey Joe, if you're watching, hi buddy, love you man. He's currently building some Abrams for my homeland to replace our older M1A1s. Again, another system I hope to find its way to Ukraine eventually. I asked him if his factory has seen any growth since the war started. He informed me that they have hired 400 new people and they are still short-staffed with high demand for their products. Keep in mind, these are corporate jobs and engineers. That's a lot of money in wages we're talking about here. And they are planning on hiring more. Looking around at the other major defense employers, and you can see the same thing. Between meeting Ukraine's needs, replacing NATO stocks, expanding the US military, building the new M10 light tank, and getting ready for a potential war with China, like US Navy shipbuilding is going round the clock. You have new aircraft carriers being laid down, new Arleigh Burks being commissioned every year. Seriously, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of new jobs are opening up in the defense sector already. That's a lot of tax dollars back into the coffers, along with some gainfully employed Americans. And not just Americans. Saab, BAE, Thals, Dassau, Bofors, Rheinmetall, and over a hundred other companies are getting in on this too. In fact, just the other day, Zelensky announced an arms manufacturer's alliance with locations to be opened in Ukraine for domestic straight-to-the-front production. I mean, hell, in Australia, we're building kamikaze drones out of cardboard. This is where we're at now. 
we're going gangbusters. We've got jobs. We've got money coming in. This is amazing. Which leads to the final part of the money discussion. The post-war period. Now let's start this off with a depressing but necessary reality. War is at its most destructive to one particular resource of a nation. The best and brightest of its citizens. Fit, young, educated men are the number one demographic hit hardest during war because they are the ones who you will fill the most dangerous or specialized combat roles or your most important roles in intelligence, government, etc. Your smartest citizens are in headquarters or command posts. Your fittest are right at the front of the fighting in special forces units or in the infantry. In both cases, during a peer-to-peer -peer conflict, these people die. A lot. And this causes a number of demographic issues. Birth rate decline, shrinking economy, and if it gets really bad, a financial death spiral. Now, I don't think that Ukrainian losses will get that severe. At least if Biden and the rest of the world starts taking this properly seriously, like they should have been from the start. But even so, a large segment of Ukraine's most economically active population will either be dead, disabled, or permanently resettled outside of the country, having made new homes elsewhere. This creates a considerable gap in the labor market. And with expedited entry into the EU planned for post-war Ukraine, this opens up some very interesting opportunities. All the major businesses and corporations you find around the world had and currently do have locations in Ukraine. The McDonald's in Kyiv is up and running, baby. The ones in areas that are currently occupied or heavily damaged will need rebuilding. The whole country will need rebuilding. And you will need both resources and manpower to do it. This has strong historical precedent. The Marshall Plan, instituted at the end of World War II, cost the United States around $200 billion in today's money. This economic stimulus to rebuild Europe's economies was supplemented by long-term loans provided by the US government and various financial institutions. What resulted was the largest economic resurgence in human history, matched only perhaps with the one that took place in Japan. With current EU trade between the United States and the EU exceeding a trillion dollars in value, providing literally millions of jobs across the various nations. Judicious but expedient investment in Ukraine is a huge opportunity, not simply for our businesses, but for our governments as well. Ukraine is one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. They are the breadbasket of Europe, and the disruption of the grain trade has been one of the largest threats for widening the war. In fact, I've been hearing reports that NATO is planning a demining effort of the Black Sea just to ensure that this grain convoy keeps going. But grain isn't the only economic resource on the market for Ukraine. They have an incredible manufacturing sector with a speciality in mineral refining. Almost every rare metal required for advanced industry can be found in the country. Nickel, titanium, iron, lithium, all of them are in huge deposits with a value some estimate to be in the trillions of dollars per year of output. That's output. Trillions per annum. That's not in total. That's per year. Naturally, as a result, mining is also a massive economic opportunity. And with that, comes Ukraine's energy sector as well, which is, despite all that, perhaps its strongest sector of all. Ukraine has over 41 billion tons of coal reserves, one of the largest deposits on Earth, in fact. They also have as much as 5.4 trillion cubic meters of natural gas and oil reserves, rivaling those in Azerbaijan. Now, let me ask you, with Russia's defeat comes the reclamation of eastern Ukraine and Crimea, which regains all of those deposits. But it also means that all of Russia and China's energy consortiums will be persona non grata, as I doubt the Ukrainians would be very happy to do business with their genocidal invaders. But they won't have the capital. Ukraine won't have the capital, the manpower, or the high-level expertise to make use of those deposits. And a lot of reconstruction work, as well as demining, will have to take place before those resources can be exploited. Now I wonder, dear viewer, who could possibly be in a position to take advantage of such a situation? Who could possibly have the upfront investment potential and the capital to invest? The extraction technology and the trained manpower to handle this gap in the market? 
Who has a large reserve army of security contractors who all have a long history of dealing with improvised explosives and landmines from over 20 years of counterinsurgency operations? Who could possibly have the trained specialists to provide high-level advisors for demobilized Ukrainian soldiers working in the defense sector or reintegrating into civilian life? Who has all the construction companies, trades personnel, to clear and rebuild large urban areas? Who has large unemployment sectors in their own countries in Europe who could use some uh, economic opportunities? And finally, who would all those tariffs and taxes and trade deals be paid to? Who will get all that money? The question is rhetorical, and I'm sure you know the answer. The answer is us, the Western world. In fact, prior to the war, there were over 100 different companies from the United States alone trying to break into the Ukrainian natural resource sector, let alone European companies, while security contractors have been active there since 2014. Let me be clear. When you hear anyone say that we are wasting money helping Ukraine, they are, and I can't stress this enough, complete morons. We will get so much back on our investment. Even if you don't care, even if you're neutral, even if you are completely morally bankrupt to the point of pure opportunism. If, imagine you were just in this for the money. You cannot deny that it will be in the West's and by extension our best interest that Ukraine wins. If you are worried about direct dividends, pick up some cheap shares in the energy sector, should the opportunity arise, and wait for your moment. Seriously. This is amazing. And of course, we're not covering the fact that if we let Russia win, if we let this get out of control, we'll have to double, triple, even quadruple the total spend on our defense to cover for that danger, for that threat. Seriously, it's completely stupid. We'll have to spend more if we don't. And if we do intervene, we get a massive profit. Seriously, I just... Come on. It's incredible. Seriously, people need to read their history books. America grew strong not because it was isolationist. Breaking out of isolation was what gave America its strength. Abandoning isolationism is what made America its superpower. Expanding to new markets, forging alliances and relationships, opening businesses all over the globe, and making prudent investments in their interests. The United States has a lot of problems, and both sides of politics seem complacent to them. The Democrats are corporate shills, and the Republicans are spiraling to their own destruction with whatever that thing is. But isolationism isn't the answer. It's a cancer which causes the rot to spread. Isolationists are a threat to democracy and harm all they touch. They breed fear, bigotry, and they act on the very worst of human impulses. And just remember, and this goes for all of us democracies all over the world, every time, every time we've trusted the far-right parties with our countries after they've promised they'll solve all our problems, every time we've trusted them to reinvest our spending into the things we need, they've cut taxes for their corporate friends and left us to rot, or worse, sent us plunging into imperialist wars. So, let this be a message. Stand with your fellow man. Stand with Ukraine. And even if you're standing with them not for their sake, stand with them for your own. Because their victory is our victory. And let's be honest. After all the brutality of the Cold War, foreign interventions and the war on terror, we can actually say without reservation that now we are fighting for what's right. And let's be real. How long has it been since we could honestly wholeheartedly say that? Slava Ukraina. And see you next time.